Our scripture reading for this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. And I am going to do my best. This is a story of Elijah and Elisha, and I'm going to do my best to keep them straight. Now the Lord was going to take Elijah up to heaven in a windstorm. And Elijah and Elisha were leaving Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. Because the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So they went down to Bethel. A group of prophets from Bethel came out to Elisha. These prophets said to Elisha, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Elisha said, yes, I know. Don't talk about it. Elijah said, Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So they went to Jericho. And a group of prophets from Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Don't talk about it. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, Seriously, dude? As the Lord lives, and that's my translation. Sorry. It's in the Hebrew, though. I don't know why they left it out. As the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So both of them went on together. Fifty members from the group of prophets also went along, but they stood at a distance. Both Elijah and Elisha stood beside the Jordan River. Elijah then took his coat, rolled it up, and hit the water. Then the water was divided in two. Both of them crossed over on dry ground. When they'd crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want me to do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elisha said, Let me have twice your spirit. Elijah said, you've made a difficult request. If you can see me when I'm taken from you, then it will be yours. If you don't see me, it won't happen. They were walking along, talking, when suddenly a fiery chariot and fiery horses appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went to heaven in a windstorm. Elisha was walking and he cried out, Oh, my father, my father, Israel's chariots chariots and its riders. When he could no longer see him, Elisha took hold of his clothes and ripped them in two. Then Elisha picked up the coat that had fallen from Elijah. He went back to the river and stood beside the banks of the Jordan River. He took the coat that had fallen from Elijah and hit the water. And he said, where is the Lord, Elijah's God? And when he hit the water, it divided in two. Then Elisha crossed over. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How many of you have ever heard a famous or powerful person give their Christian testimony? An athlete or an artist, a a singer, a politician, someone like that. And particularly if they came to faith or rededicated to themselves, rededicated themselves to faith after they've achieved worldly success, there are generally a couple themes to those testimonies, right? They start to sound very similar, right? They'll say things like, I achieved everything I set out to achieve, or I achieved what the whole world has always wanted, and I found it to be what? Empty. I've achieved the thing I always dreamed of, the thing I always wanted to do. I won the prize. I got the money. I got the office. I did the thing. I accomplished the thing, but it just felt empty. How many, two, how many times, too, have you heard people say things like, I'm recognized everywhere. Everyone knows who I am, but I feel so, what? Lonely. People may recognize me, but they don't know me. You can be recognizable to an untold number of people and still feel unknown. And, of course, this isn't just a feeling of the rich and famous. How many of you mm, along during that? Because you feel it, too. How many of you hold a position, whether it's in your job or in your community, or even just being mom or dad, where you feel like, oh my goodness, my worth and value is wrapped up in who other people think I am. My guess is some of you have felt this way, or you know and love people who have felt this way. People who feel like everything in the world is on their shoulders, that they have a responsibility to hold everything together. And of course, that's a great temptation in today's world, isn't it? How do we measure worth and value in today's world? Your productivity, right? What's like the biggest section in a bookstore these days? 
self-help and productivity. How do I get better? How do I get faster? How do I get more efficient? How do I make sure the graph is always going up and to the right? Our goals, our income, our sales numbers, our grades, our kids' grades, our success, our influence, our views, our clicks, our downloads. We look at these charts, and if they're going up, we're successful. And if they're going down, we're a failure. And we think we've just got to always make them go up compared to last year, compared to other people around us. And if they are, then we are worthy and helpful and valuable. And if they're not, then maybe it's time for us to step aside. There's also a tendency in our world that's so obsessed with personality and celebrity to even turn regular people into a form of micro-celebrity. Let me give you an example. This, and this was like coming up on 20 years ago. I was at the University of Florida. I was taking a microeconomics class with 500 other freshmen. There are no classrooms at the University of Florida that can hold 500 people. There's plenty of sports stadiums, but there's no classrooms that can hold 500 people. It was also scheduled at 7.30 in the morning. So there were about maybe 30 folks who would wake up and go to, to the class. And I was not one. I'm a morning person, but even then, at that point in my life, that was not going to work for me. Also, this professor tended to talk a little slow. And if you've ever heard me talk, you know my brain works a little faster than slow, sometimes too fast, and I'll admit that. Sometimes my brain gets going faster than my mouth. Uh, but I learned that if I watched the live stream, I could play it at 1.5 speed. Anyone listen to podcasts or audiobooks on 1.5 speed? I could, I could learn it and get through it faster. Well, one day I was in line at one of the local burrito restaurants, and in walked the microeconomics professor. And I got that little jolt of adrenaline as if Tim Tebow had just walked in the burrito place. Why is that? Because I had only ever seen him on TV or on a screen. He was a celebrity. No, he was not. He was a freshman microeconomics professor at a state school. But you still got that jolt. So what do we do with people who become micro-celebrities or macro-celebrities? They become people who aren't actually fully formed human beings with families and limitations and growth areas. But they become personalities, and especially in today's world, it's only worse 20 years later. Everyone who's just a personality becomes someone we have to decide, do we like them or do we not like them? Do we support them or do we not support them? Do we agree with them or do we disagree with them? Is their output something that makes us feel better, or is their output something that makes us feel worse? And look, this is understandable, still unfair, but understandable with the Tom Hanks, the Tom Brady's, or the Tom Petty's of the world. But how many of you have ever felt this way? That you have people in your life that know who you are, but they don't know you. And that they judge you based on your output. And I'm not just talking about at work. Some of you might even feel this way in your family or in your friendships. That there are people who look to you for what you can provide rather than who you are. And even if it isn't happening to you, it's certainly a temptation to fall into this line of, of thinking. And like I said, this kind, of, this kind of stuff comes up in testimonies of famous people, but really even in famous people who don't come to find Christ, you still hear them talk about this pressure. But of course the difference is if they found Christ, then, then what happens? They find their purpose, they find their identity, they find their mission, they find a sense of peace in Christ because Christ releases them from chasing the goals of this world and instead find peace in their identity. They find meaning in life through their relationship with Christ and praise God that is exactly how it should work. All of us, whether you're Tom Hanks or you're Pastor Dan or you're someone else, you should find your identity in Christ. You should find your mission in Christ. You should find your worth and value in Christ and who God made you to be. And I want to find the right way to say this, and so I wrote it down just to try to find the right way to say this, and that is that when our focus and foundation are in Christ, it will change our lives and it will give us a sense of peace and purpose and mission. But at the same time, I would imagine that you all can recognize that you can be a Christian and you can be living a life that you are hoping is in service of Christ and still at times feel empty or feel that pressure. And that is because we can be doing all the right things but for the wrong reason. Our focus on our foundation can still be off, even if we're in church every Sunday, listening to Z88.3 in our car every time it's on, doing our morning Bible readings and devotions and all of these things. Our focus and our foundation matter. And today we're going to look at 
a part of the life story of one of the most famous and powerful people in the Bible who still struggled with this. And my hope is that today, reflecting on the end of this person's life, will be a source of hope and a source of good news for you if you feel this way, or for you if there's someone in your life that feels this way that you love and you want to know how to support. And so today we're looking at the Old Testament prophet of Elijah. It's pretty famous. How many of you have heard of Elijah before you got here today? Right? Yeah. How many of you know like a crazy VBS song about Elijah? I mean, Elijah is one of those characters from the Old Testament that you hear about. He's, uh, he lived in the 9th century B.C., he was a prophet that was active in the northern kingdom of Israel. So just real fast, the, the people of God entered the promised land. They lived as a unified group of people for a while. Then they became a nation. They had King David, first King Saul, King David, King Solomon. But then by the end of Solomon's life, he had not set things up well. His son was a real twerp and alienated 10 of the 12 tribes. And they split off and became the northern kingdom of Israel. And just Judah and one other tribe became the nation of Judah in the south. Now, they still had Jerusalem and the palace and the temple, but they were pretty isolated. And the other ten kingdoms, or the other ten tribes, created this new kingdom to the north. Well, here's just a little thumbnail to understand the next section of the history in the Old Testament. In the southern kingdom, there were a few good kings. In the northern kingdom, there were no good kings. None. All of their leaders were awful. All of their leaders led them astray. And Elijah drew the short straw in being the prophet during the time of one of the worst of the worst, a king named Ahab. And you may or may not recognize his name, but I know you know the name of his wife, Jezebel. Whether you recognize she was biblical or not, I'm sure you've heard of a Jezebel, right? She was so bad, she's literally become a name for a type of person. Well, this was a political marriage, Ahab got married to Jezebel when he was still just a prince. His dad was king of Israel. And Jezebel was the queen or the princess in the neighboring um, kingdom. And you did political marriages, right? You, you married off to, to create a political alliance, a military alliance, an economic alliance. And it brought a lot of good political and economic things to the kingdom of Israel. But the problem is those people didn't know or worship or trust Yahweh. They worshiped Baal and Asherah. And Jezebel worshiped foreign gods. And for all of the good political and economic things, it was a disaster for the only thing that mattered in the kingdom of Israel, and that was their obedience to God. When Ahab became king, he decided to build a temple to Baal so that his wife would have a place to worship. He allowed her to bring in hundreds of priests and prophets to this false foreign god. And poor Elijah, he's the prophet, which doesn't mean a, a fortune teller. Prophets are mouthpieces for God. They speak the truth of God, and that occasionally meant telling things that would happen in the future. But as we learned last year, the Bible Project affectionately calls prophets covenant watchdogs. Their job is to keep in mind what the people of God had agreed to, and anytime the people started to waver from it, to call them back to holiness, to call them back to obedience to the covenant. And Elisha was doing this with at least one hand tied behind his back, because every prophet before him in the scriptures also had a leadership position. A great example is Moses. He was one of the primary prophets of the Old Testament, but he was also the leader. And then you had the judges in the book of Judges, and they were prophets, and they got to be the leader for a period of time. But even earlier, or, or then later down the road, you had King David, but he had a prophet, Nathan. But Nathan worked in the palace with him. They had a good relationship. Elijah was an outsider. He had no positional authority, no legal authority, no vocational authority. The only authority he had was the calling of God. Friends, what's the only authority that matters? The, the calling and empowering of God. But does a king who is building temples to other gods recognize that authority? No. So despite the immense challenges, though, God used Elijah. And in a lot of ways, he became famous. He wasn't the only prophet of God in these days, and that's a key thing to remember as we get into this, but he was the main prophet. He was who God used to call out the king. He was who God used to speak truth to power. He was the primary prophet. And after years of vocally criticizing King Ahab from a distance, God tells Elijah, now is the time for you to confront him face to face. And this is how that confrontation went. First Kings chapter 18. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, the one who troubles Israel? Elijah answered, I haven't troubled Israel. You and your father's house have. Sounds like elementary school, like playground argument. 
you're the problem. No, you're the problem. No, you're the problem. But I think there's an important thing to note here. Both of them are accusing the other one, a singular person, of being the source of all the trouble. Now, I think Elijah's got a point. If you're the king and you've built temples and welcomed in priests and prophets of a false and foreign god, you probably are a big source of trouble. But the king is also pegging a lot on Elijah, isn't he? When you are the primary, when you are the focus, when you are the leader, when you are the one who feels all the pressure on your shoulders, certainly you get an undue amount of praise, but how many of you know you also get an undue amount of criticism and pushback? When you're the tip of the spear, when you're the level that people can have access to, people's frustrations and complaints, their dissatisfaction ends up getting dumped on you, and even if it's not fair, you still feel it, and perception is in a lot of ways reality, at least emotionally. And even if you don't agree with it, you then start to tell yourself, well, if they're going to think of me as the problem, then I need to be the solution. And you begin to think that it's all on your shoulders to figure out how to respond. And actually, this confrontation leads to one of the most incredibly iconic scenes in the whole Bible. Elijah says, you know what? It's time. It's time to decide. We're either worshiping Yahweh or we're worshiping Baal. Let's figure it out right now. Let's figure out who the true God is. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to get all your priests and prophets together, which there's 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. So 850 of you are going to build an altar and put a bull on top of it and prepare it for sacrifice, but don't light it on fire. And then I'm going to build an altar and I'm going to prep a bull and I'm going to put it on the altar, but I'm not going to light it on fire. And then we're going to pray to our God and whoever accepts the offering and lights it on fire is the winner. And the king said, that sounds like a good idea. And all the people were like, that sounds like the Super Bowl. Let's do it. And so they call all these people in, and you've got 850 people on one side of the hill, and you have one on the other side of the hill. And Elias is even somewhat of a gentleman and says, you go ahead and start. You pick your bull first, so you don't think I'm like forcing it. He's not like a magician doing a card trick. Two bulls, you pick first, you get started. So they get started in the morning, and these 850 priests and prophets start calling out. They start dancing, and nothing happens. And Elijah starts to talk smack. Cameron's laughing. He knows this story. Maybe your God is lost. Maybe he's traveling. Or maybe he's taking a nap. Shout louder. That'll wake him up. I'm I'm not paraphrasing. That is what Elijah says. And then they start to get desperate. And they start going above and beyond. They're sh- they've already shouted as loud as they can. So they start cutting themselves and bleeding all over the place to try to show their devotion and willingness to give of their life force to this God and nothing happens. That started in the morning. It now says evening is drawing near and Elijah decides, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get going. And he hadn't even built his altar yet. He goes out and he gets 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He sets up the bull and then he goes, wait, 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 one more thing. Before I get started... I want you to go out and get 12 large jars of water and just soak the bull, the wood, the rocks, everything. Just soak my altar down. And here's what happened. Elijah drew near and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. I have done all of these things at your instruction. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, Lord, are the real God and that you can change their hearts. Then the Lord's fire fell. It consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and all the water. Amazing, right? He showed them one on 850. It wasn't really one on 850, right? Who was the one that did the work? God, right? It's so dramatic, but also it was just kind of one. I told you before, Elijah wasn't the only prophet in Israel. And yet it never occurred to him at any point throughout this that maybe I could use a little bit of help. Maybe I could call some other people to come and, and watch and, or mentor them or whatever. He just decides to do it all by himself. And as we're reading this story, he says that he's doing what God instructed him to do, but at least narratively speaking, this challenge seems to be his idea. And thankfully, God backed him up on it. And so God honored the test, but I think this is a window into Elijah's headspace that he never thought to ask for help. 
And following the test, something that it just doesn't probably fit into our modern-day worldview happens. Elijah says, round up all the false prophets and kill them, and they do. And that, isn't, that might be troubling, that might concern us, it doesn't really fit in our worldview, it doesn't fit in our sense of the New Testament, love your enemy and these things, but it fits in the Old Testament narrative of the prophet's role being to, to purify the nation of Israel and to call them back to holiness. And uh, word gets to Jezebel. And do you think she was convinced? No, she's furious. She doesn't care the results of, of this little magic trick in her eyes. 850 of her kinsmen, 850 people from her homeland were just slaughtered. So she sends word to Elijah, if you aren't dead like them by the end of the day, then I haven't done my job. So what does the victorious, smack-talking prophet of the Most High God do? Does he say, come and get me? Elijah was terrified. He got up and ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah. Do you remember where Judah was? It's the other country. He, he flees the country to get away from the queen. And he left his assistant there. So apparently he at least has someone that gets him coffee. And at this point, through his fear and desperation, he even abandons his assistant. He longed for his own death. It is more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. And he lay down and slept under the solitary broom bush. Doing great things and doing great things for God can be really uplifting. But how many of you have ever achieved something, done something great, even selflessly speaking, and then been exhausted at the end of it? How many of you have carried the weight of your family or a family member or your job or a community or a friendship or a situation for a period of time and it seems like it's all worked out and then at the end of it you've just crashed because you've been carrying that weight for so long. Even achievement for the kingdom of God when our focus and foundation are off can leave us empty. And notice Elijah even, he even doubles down. He abandons his assistant. I'm the only one. It's only me. If I can't do it, no one can. And I can't do it anymore. So God, you might as well take me out. He's in a spiral. He's digging himself in a hole. Now, how does God respond? Well, that was dumb. I bailed you out. But please don't do that again. Or option two. Hey, no one ever said following me was easy. Buck up, buddy. Be strong in your faith. Enough of you have been here enough time to know that I ask leading questions. Are either of those what God said? God actually doesn't even say anything at first. God delivers a pizza. You think I'm joking, and I'm sort of joking. But if you read the story, it says he woke up from his nap and there was a flatbread and a jar of water. Divine pizza. And Elijah eats it up, and God says, go back to sleep. Take another nap. And so Elijah goes back to sleep, and when he wakes up, there's another pizza. And a refilled jar of whatever it was he was drinking. Coke Zero, water, I don't know. When Elijah is spiraling, does God accuse him of lacking faith? Or does God recognize that our physical and mental health are a factor of faith? Did God look at Elijah and say, mm, you should just believe harder? Or did he look at him and say, you know, a snack and a nap might do you good? Because you seem a little hangry at the moment. You seem a little empty. God cares for Elijah as a person apart from his role as a prophet. And he takes care of his physical needs. He takes care of his mental needs. But he also doesn't leave him there. He then guides Elijah to walk to what this uh, book calls Mount Horeb. This is one of those things where places in the Bible have like 15 names. This is Mount Sinai. God leads him back to the mountain where the people of God went after they left Egypt, where Moses went to the top of the mountain and received the Ten Commandments, he takes him to the place where the covenant he has spent his life defending was made. Sometimes when we are empty, we need to go back to the beginning. Sometimes when our faith is struggling, the last thing to do is grab the theology book that's this big and go grab the book that's this big, or have the conversation with the pastor or the parent or the friend that helped you learn of Jesus' love the first time. 
So Elijah goes there, and there's all these parallels in his life to Moses. And so here he is at the same mountain, and he goes up the mountain that Moses went up. And here's another famous story you probably are somewhat familiar with. God tells Elijah, I'm going to pass by, and a great wind passes by. Is God in the great wind? No. An earthquake happens. Is God in the earthquake? No. A wall of fire rushes by. Is God in the fire? No. But then a still small sound, barely more than a silence, happens. And Elijah recognizes this is where God is. And a lot of pastors and preachers, probably even myself, can over-systematize this. So you see, we worship the God who speaks through the still small voice. Get off your phone and start listening to God. (laughs) Which is, we probably all need to do that. But when Moses went up to the top of the mountain, how did God make himself visible? through wind and fire and earthquake. God was present in these things at this place a couple generations ago. So God can come in the fire and the earthquake and the wind. But perhaps what God is trying to tell Elijah is you are not Moses. Stop trying to be someone you're not. How many times when we feel like we're all alone are we carrying that weight because we are trying to be someone we're not? Either because we're trying to be someone else, we're trying to be our father, we're trying to be our boss, we're trying to be the boss other people want us to be. How many times are we just trying to be the we that we wish we were rather than the we that we are? Stop trying to be someone else and be you. But also there's a chance that he was saying, dude, you're living at 11 out of 10, like nonstop. You should probably calm down a little bit. And this is so beautiful, right? It should transform Elijah's life. He should fall to his knees. He should be in tears. Let's let's see what he learned from this. The voice of God came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces. Good start. Because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars. They have murdered your prophets with the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they want to take my life too. Did Elijah learn the lesson? No. He is still, is his focus on God or the foundation, the kingdom of God, the mission of God? No. Who is he still caring about above and beyond everything else? Himself. So here's a funny thing from a a Jewish practice. I find it funny. They probably find it really profound. Uh, at At a Jewish circumcision ceremony, if you're practicing it the traditional way, you leave an empty chair for Elijah. The reason is, and I think this is God has got a great sense of humor. You think you're the only one that's faithful to God? Then I'm going to make you attend every other faithful practice of Jewish people for the rest of eternity. (laughs) Maybe then you'll get it. So it's not, but he's not getting it. So God decides, you know what? We need to get back to work. Because we also tend to vacillate between two vastly different ends of the spectrum. We either want total control of our life or we decide, well, I guess I can't control anything. I'll just give it all over to God. Are either one of those right? No. When we read Genesis chapter 1, which we've done like 50 times in the last three years, God gives us a mission. God gives us a responsibility, but it's not everything or nothing. It's somewhere in the middle. And here's what God said to him. You're going to go anoint two kings, including a new king of Israel. Then I want you to go and anoint a man named Elisha and make him your successor. What does a successor do? They carry on your work. I'm Cameron's successor. He carried the load of this church for a period of time and then he handed it to me and someday I will hand it to someone else. Did the church end when Cameron left? No, because there was a successor. Will it end when I leave? No, because there's a successor. But what's the number one fear of leaders who think it's all on their shoulders? Everything will fall apart if I stop. Everything will fall apart if I leave. Everything will fall apart if I take a day off. Am I preaching to anyone other than myself? And we finally reach today's passage. (laughs) Actually, one more thing before we get there. So God finished that. Go get a successor. Then he says, I have preserved those who remain in Israel, totaling 7,000. Dude, you are not alone, and you're not done. So we've gotten, we're going to do a time jump. We're now at the end of Elijah's ministry. God is about to take him up in a fiery chariot to heaven. 
which is amazing and terrifying, and due to whatever this all is weighing on Elijah, he seems to be falling into old patterns, because three times, what did he do? God has called me to go here, and Elisha, you're just going to stay here. And what does Elijah say? No way, dude, I'm coming with you to the end. As long as God's living and you're living, I'm with you. I'm not leaving. I'm not abandoning you. I'm not your unnamed assistant. I'm your successor. I'm coming with you. And at the first two stops along the way, a big group of people, who are also, by the way, prophets of God. So Elijah's clearly not alone, because there's all these prophets in every town coming up and sharing what's going on. And they come to Elisha, and they say, don't you know God's going to take your master today? And Elisha says, what? Stop talking about that. I don't want to talk about that. Why does he not want to talk about it? How hard is it to help someone else stay focused if you yourself are not focused? Elisha has a lot coming up. He's about to take over a very important role. It's going to be a lot of pressure. But that's not his job yet. Elijah still has work to do. And so in order to help Elijah stay focused, he needs to stay focused. But they finally get to their third destination. It's the Jordan River. And Elijah rolls up his coat, which was the symbol of his authority. He takes off basically his uniform. He rolls it up, and he slaps the river, and the river splits. Which we have multiple stories of bodies of water being split in the Old Testament. And they walk across. They're actually, at this point, they're leaving the Holy Land, and they're walking out into the wilderness. Who led God's people through water into the wilderness? Moses, right? Through the the Red Sea. They go out into the wilderness. And uh, the fiery chariots come. They take Elijah. As he's going up, he throws his coat down. Elisha picks it up. He comes back to the river. He rolls up that coat. He slaps the water and says, where is the God of Elijah? Which is basically his way of saying, all right, do, did I get it? Do, do I have the power now? And the water splits. And Elisha, Elijah's successor, walks across the Jordan River into the promised land. Which is exactly what happened with Moses' successor, Joshua. He split the river Jordan and led the people into the promised land. God's plan continues. Elijah played his part, but the work of God continues without him. There's one last detail that I think reveals that Elijah actually did get it in the end. And that is that as they are walking out in the wilderness, Elijah turns to Elisha and says, Is there any final thing I can do for you? This is it. This is the last chance you got. What can I do for you? And Elisha says, give me a double share of your spirit. Which sounds kind of greedy, but it has to do with inheritance. If you were a son in the ancient world, you got twice as much as all the other sons if you were the eldest son. That was just a sign that you were the successor. You were the new paternal leader of your family. So by asking for a double share, Elisha's not being greedy. He's just saying, I want to be your successor, which God has already said he is. And Elijah's response is, you've made a difficult request. If you can see me when I'm taken from you, then it will be yours. If you don't see me, it won't happen. So Elijah has said, what can I do for you? Elisha says, give me a double share of your spirit. Elijah's answer isn't yes or no. Why not? Who controls that situation? God does. Elijah has no control over who his successor is because he's going to be gone. He doesn't get to name a successor. That's what God does. He doesn't give the Spirit of God. That's what God does. Elijah has finally realized in his final moment that this is God's job, and I'm going to let him do it. But he says, stay with me. Stay close. Stay faithful to what God has called you to do. And if you're still with me when God takes you, then it'll probably work out the way God said. But if you drop off and you're not with me when God takes me, then it probably won't work out because then you will have left the faithful path. So he's still guiding, he's still mentoring, but he's also recognizing what is and is not in his control. Friends, being a leader is hard. Being king or queen or president or prime minister is hard. Being mayor is hard. Being a pastor is hard. Being CEO is hard. Being mom or dad is hard. Being a human being in 2022 is hard. Hard. especially when you think the weight of the world is on your shoulders that without you your family will fall apart without you your company will fall apart without you the community will fall apart and loving someone who sees themselves that way is also hard isn't it because some of you don't struggle with that some of you are actually healthy people congratulations but you also know and love and work with or even live with people who have this perspective and loving them is hard 
Because like Elijah, they keep wanting to push you away. But like Elisha, we're called to stay focused and stay with them. The hope and the good news of Elijah's story is that there is far more help out there than you think there is or than you can see. But you have to be willing to ask for it, and you have to want to see it. The love, the support, the compassion, the care, and at times the honest prodding of God and the people who love you, the help you refocus on God, on what's true, and what matters most. Amen. Thank you.